Hey, we're starting a brand new series uh, this morning that's called Crave More Presence. I'll explain why it's called that as we uh, get going. But we are in the book of Ruth, all right? So hopefully you have a Bible on you. And uh, turn to the book of Ruth. Use your table of contents if you need. Uh, It's the eighth book of the Bible, I believe. It goes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Eighth book. Only four chapters, so it's easy to uh, miss. But make sure you find it. You're going to want to follow along. Garrett, can you turn me down a little bit? It gets annoying because this, like, rattles. Have you ever noticed that, Garrett, when you speak? Or, like, anyone speaks? It's just, like, rattles. It's kind of annoying. So I think lowering it down will help that. Huh? Yeah, Old Testament. If I said New Testament, I misspoke. Eighth book of the Bible is where we are, book of Ruth. It's actually one of my favorite stories I think if you were in light last year, uh, the girls looked at this story. Um, But I like it. I enjoy it. Hopefully you guys do too. We're going to be going chapter by chapter, pulling some things out of it. want to remind you that black bucket in the back is where you guys can drop prayer requests. If there's something crazy going on in your life, if there's something you want to celebrate going on in your life, let us know. Write that down. Drop it there when you leave. We will pray for you this week. And if you have any offering that you'd like to leave here at North Coast, just drop it back there when you leave as well. And I think last announcement, Garrett said it, but if he didn't or if he didn't hear, the City of Angels gifts are due next Sunday. So bring those in this Tuesday or next weekend. That'd be great. Thanks for those of you that are participating. I am going to pray, and we'll get started. You can follow along on this red note sheet today. Let's go ahead and pray. God, I just want to thank you for who you are, and I just want to invite you into this place, God. Uh, Thank you so much for how much you love us. I pray that we can come to understand that even more today as we dive into your word and we could be people that just want to be in your presence because of how much you love us. Um, It is in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, so one of my good friends, his name is Michael, and I've shared many stories uh, about Michael. If you were at the Salt and Light kickoff, it was either September or October, I told the, the story of when Michael and I were hiding, trying to scare our friends. And, you know, I've realized every time... I hang out with Michael, I always find myself in some type of like awkward situation or some type of situation that I really don't want to be in. I remember, uh, I think it was my senior year of high school, maybe my first year of college, all of our friends decided that we were going to have a huge water balloon fight at a park like at nighttime. And we had actually done it the year before, and we knew that this one park, the sprinklers went off at like 8 o'clock. So we said, blow up as many water balloons as you can, and let's meet at Lake Park at 8 o'clock, and we're going to have a full-out war. So uh, I think about like 20, 30 of us, we all blew up balloons, and I blew up some of my house. And two of my friends met at my house, and we were going to carpool over to uh, the park. One being my friend Alex, who played football in college. He was a large guy. I remember this specifically. Uh, I drive like a little Honda Civic, and because he's this football player, it took him probably six different tries on how to get into the passenger seat of my car. It's pretty entertaining there. And then my friend Michael joined us as well, and he sat in the back seat with the water balloons. We're driving over to the park, and we are on Temple Heights. If you're familiar with that, Temple Heights is on your left, and then the uh, Two Brothers from Italy Pizza, that is on your right. We're driving right there, coming up to the light, when there's this random pedestrian that's on our right that Michael decides, you know what, I just want to throw a water balloon at this random guy. Now, you say it's mean, but quick side story, my friend used to go fishing at the pier, and he would catch fish, and then he would just drive by throwing fish at people, all right? So that's pretty mean, all right? So when you compare that to water balloons, water balloons still messed up. I'm not saying do it, but compared to fish, I guess it's a little better. I don't know, um, unless you want to smell like seafood. But uh, So Michael decides to throw this water balloon at this random pedestrian, and he chucks it out the back. And I don't remember if it hit the guy or if it landed right in front of him, but whichever it did, this guy was pretty mad. And I see in my rearview mirror, he actually pulls out a knife and he starts to charge right at my car. Now, the good thing is I'm in a car so I can speed off 
you would think. But no, there's a red light in front of me. And I would have ran the red light so I don't get shanked by this guy. But there were two cars in front of me. So now I have to stop. I couldn't figure out how to get around them. So now I'm stuck at this red light, two cars in front of me. And there's this guy with a knife just charging right at my car. And, you know, I'm thinking, okay, is he going to scratch my car up? Is he going to try to, like, bust in and stab it? Like, I don't really know what's going on. Um, but I remember literally right as he got to my car, I think he even touched my car, is when the light turned green, the car started moving in front of me, and I was able to just speed off, thankfully, so I didn't have to get shanked and die that, uh, that night, and we can go and have our uh, water balloon fight and everything. And, you know... That's just another story where I've realized, man, every time, not every time, but a lot of times I hang out with Michael, we find ourselves in some, like, awkward situation that <laughs> we really don't want to be in. And kind of shifting from a, a funny story to, to more serious, I'm willing to bet, because of the size of the people in here, we find ourselves in situations that we don't want to be in. I'm willing to bet that some of you right now are dealing with something in your life that you wish you could just get out of, that you could just speed out of, but maybe you've tried, and like it, it's just something you're in. And maybe you're there because of something you've done, or maybe it's just because that's life, or it's what someone else has done. I don't know if it's something with parents that you're dealing with. Maybe it's something with drama with friends. Maybe it's something going on at school, something with your grades, it's something with your sports teams. Maybe um, it's something with your health. I don't know what's going on in your life, but I bet some of you wish you can just get out of whatever situation that you find yourself in right now because it's not looking good. And today as we jump into the book of Ruth, we're going to read about a family that find themselves in a situation that they really do not want to be in. And there's some lessons we're going to be able to pull out of that. So we are in Ruth chapter 1 today, starting in verse 1. Hopefully you're open to there already. I'm going to have you circle and underline some things. But it says here in chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. You might want to circle that word. There's a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem, which you might want to circle that word, in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. So in that first sentence, there's actually a lot that I need to talk about for a second. First off, what's the bad thing that's taking place in the story? There's a what in the land? There's a famine in the land. But what's interesting is, does anyone know what Bethlehem stands for? Anyone know what Bethlehem stands for? Yes. House of bread. Stands for house of bread. So it's a little bit ironic that in the house of bread, there is a famine going on. You see, God said in the book of Deuteronomy that he said, hey, Israel, if you are ever going, uh, or I mean, if you are ever following me and you are obeying me and you are listening to me, I'm always going to provide for you. There's always going to be food. You're going to be okay. But if you don't follow me, this promise doesn't apply to you. So what it's telling us right now is that these people are not following God. They're not listening to what he wants them to do. They are not obeying God. And because of that, now there is a famine. So it says that because there's a famine, they decide to go to, what's the place they go to? Moab, all right? Now, if you're taking notes in your Bible or on the note sheet, you might want to write Genesis 19, verse 30 to 38. You don't need to flip there. Genesis 19, 30 to 38. That portion of scripture is going to tell us how Moab actually started. And it's crazy, all right, but listen to this. Moab started because there was this guy named Lot. Maybe you've read about him in Genesis. There's this guy named Lot. He had two daughters that decided to get their dad drunk, and then they both decided to sleep with their father, incest, and they both got pregnant, and one of the kids' names was Moab, all right? He was the father. He started this place called Moab, all right? Crazy, disgusting, welcome to church if it's your first time, but that's how Moab got started. And something you need to know about Moab is, you could probably tell this, but Moab was a very sinful place, and it was a place that pretty much worshipped Satan and had all these different fake gods, 
And that was the place that this family decided to go to. They thought going there, things were going to get better. Do you think things are going to get better for them? No, they're not. Let's continue. Verse 2. It says, The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were both Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now it says, now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. All right? Sudden, he gone. And then, uh, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. You see, they went to Moab thinking things were going to get better. But the thing is, things not get better. Naomi loses the three guys in her life. They're gone. They died. And what we're going to see here through the story is, is they're starting to run from God, but that's not the answer to their problems. The first thing that you guys can write down if you're taking notes is running from God is never the answer. You see, running from God, running from what he's asking you to do, that's never the answer. I still remember uh, when I was in, what grade was this, fifth? I forget. I was playing baseball, and I was playing AAA over at Oceanside American Little League. And our team, we were down 11 to nothing entering the bottom of the sixth inning. So if you know anything about baseball, you could tell we're about to lose. In Little League, you only play six innings. We're down 11 runs. We have to have some rally, some crazy rally just to get back in this game. Well, you know what? We did, and we scored 10 runs. So now it's 11 to 10. No one's on base, two outs, and I come up to the plate. And I remember I hit a single, so I'm keeping the rally alive. But for some reason, I decide to just round first base and go to second. Now, if the outfielder threw a good throw, I would have easily been out. But it was a bad throw. So I got to second base, thankfully. But once again, for some reason, I decided to round second base, even though the third base coach is holding his hands up to stop. And I decided to run over to third base. And as I'm running to third, I get into a pickle. And they get me, and I'm out. And we lose the game, rally done, all because of my mistake. I remember I was so uh, mad at myself, and I was so embarrassed. The second I got home, I ran up to my room, I grabbed a pillow, and then I ran to the bathroom, probably because I could lock that door, and I locked myself in the bathroom, and I remember just crying in the bathroom. I'm just like, I'm never coming out of here. I'm sleeping in here tonight. And I was just like crying and crying and just so upset by that. I mean, obviously, I, I eventually got out of the bathroom. I'm here today. But my, my parents talked me out of it uh, that night to come out of the bathroom. But you see, in, in that time, in that like situation where I was mad at myself, a situation I did not want to be in, um, I decided just to run, and I decided to hide, and I decided to lock myself away. And I, I don't know where you guys are running in your situation. Because some of you are in different situations where maybe you're there because of something you did. It's your mistake. Maybe it's something someone else did. Maybe that's just life. No, it's no one's fault. I don't know where you're running. Some of you, you're, you're just running to sinful things. Some of you, you, you're running to worldly things. Some of you, you're, you're running to comfortable things. But let me tell you this. You've got to run to God. He is always the answer. You could try to figure out things on your own, but that's not going to solve it. Things are only going to get worse if you decide to take it into your own hands. You see, some of you in this room want to do things your own way. You say, you know, I know I should probably follow the Bible. I should probably do the things God wants me to do. I'll wait till I'm older, and then I'm going to follow uh, God. But just because that's your intention doesn't mean that's going to happen. You see, when they left Bethlehem, it, the, another translation is going to say they, they sojourned. And sojourn means that they had an intent to come back. They said, we're going to come back someday. But did the guys in the story come back? No. They, they died before they ever had a chance to come back. And who's to say, I mean, kind of dramatic, but you won't die. 
Who, who's to say maybe not that dramatic? Who's to say you will turn around and decide to start following God? You can't bank your life that, hey, in 10 years I'm going to do that. No, you, it, your faith is for now. Running to God now is the answer. Continuing the story in verse 6, it said, When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. You see what she's doing right now? She's heading the right direction. She's making moves in the right direction. She was living in Moab. Now she's saying, hey, I'm, I'm going back. Here in uh, verse 8, it says, Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. So she's saying, hey, I'm going back, but y- you don't need to follow me. It says, then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight, then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. You might want to circle this. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. You see, the major lesson that we learn here that you guys can write down is this, is that life apart from the Lord is never better. Life apart from God is not the best option. And I know that there's some of you in this room right now that you're only here maybe because like your family made you come or because a friend invited you. Maybe you don't really have interest in any of this. But let me, let me just plead with you and, and tell you that life with God, it's the better option. I know there's people in your life that might make fun of you. And actually, if you are following God, there should be people that are mocking you and teasing you. The Bible even says that people are going to hate you for being believers. It even says that. And I know it could be hard, and I know the world might say, just live a little. Life with God is always the better option. I was inspired by the story that I've shared with you guys in the past. Um, It involves this girl whose name was Mabel. Kind of an interesting name. But there's this book that I'm going to read a section out of in a second of this, this guy. It's the author of this book. I believe he was a pastor as well at the time. That he decided to go to this hospital that was in the area. And he wanted to actually um, give a flower to one of the elderly people that lived there. Just a nice gesture. He said, hey, I want to go and I just want to bless someone's day. So he goes to this hospital and he's looking for someone to give a flower to. And then he sees this woman that later on he's going to find out her name is Mabel. And let me just read to you the description of what this woman looked like and where she lived. It says this in the book says, as I neared the end of this hallway, I saw an old woman strapped up in a wheelchair. Her face was an absolute horror. The empty stare and white pupils of her eyes told me that she was blind. The large hearing aid over one ear told me that she was almost deaf. One side of her face was being eaten away by cancer. There is a discolored and running sore covering part of one cheek, and it had pushed her nose to one side dropped one eye, and distorted her jaw so that what should have been the corner of her mouth was the bottom of her mouth. As a consequence, she drooled constantly. I was told later that when nurses arrived, the supervisors would send them to feed this woman, thinking that if they could stand this sight, they could stand anything in the building. I also learned later that this woman, listen to this, was 89 years old and that she had been here bedridden, blind, nearly deaf and alone for 25 years. This was Mabel. So he sees this woman, he finds out about her, and he says, wow, like this is the woman that I need to bless this flower with. So he walks up to this woman, and um, he, he gives her the flower, and she says, hey, thanks for this flower, but 
you know, I can't really see the flower that well. Could I actually give it to someone else? And he's like, well, yeah, yeah, that'd be awesome. Of course. So he starts pushing her in the wheelchair around the hospital, and they come across some other woman, and she extends the flower and says, here you go, this flower is from Jesus. And instantly, the, the, the author, the pastor is like, wait, what? Like, this woman's a believer? This woman's a Christian? Like, I would have assumed that this woman would be upset with God because the situations and everything going on in her life aren't the best right now. And he's blown away by it. So he actually decides that he's going to go back a few times a month and he's going to visit with Mabel because really she has no friends there. She's just sitting in a bed. Only the nurses talk to her. So he's like, well, I'll hang out with her. So he goes back a few times a month and he starts to think, you know, Mabel's blind. She can't move around. No one comes and visits her. She can't really do anything, but her brain's fine. Like, what, what does she think about when she's here? So he decides to ask her, Mabel, what do you think about when you're laying here in the hospital bed just all by yourself? And here's what she replied with. She said, I think about my Jesus. I sat here and thought for a moment about the difficulty for me of thinking about Jesus for even five minutes. And I asked, what do you think about Jesus? And she replied slowly and deliberately as I wrote, I think about how good he's been to me. He's been awfully good to me in my life, you know. I'm one of those kind who's mostly satisfied. Lots of folks wouldn't care much for what I think. Lots of folks would think I'm kind of old-fashioned. But I don't care. I'd rather have Jesus. He's all the world to me. And when she said this, he was blown away because he, he's like, you think about how good God's been to you. Because, guys, if I'm being honest with you, this is probably what he thought and this is what I think. It, if I can't move, if I can't hear, if I can't see 25 years, I have no friends, I don't know if I'm thinking about how good God is. I'm probably sitting there bitter at the world, probably a little bit upset at God that this is my life right now. But Mabel says, I think about how good God is. I'd rather have Jesus. He's all the world to me. And you know what I think Mabel realized? I think sitting there, she realized that things in this world, that they may make you happy, but they're not going to make you joyful. That the things in this world, they're going to make you happy for a little bit, but you're not going to be happy forever. Like, think about it. How come every single year we have to come up with a new Christmas list? It's because we're not happy with the things that we used to have. The things that we got last year. They, they made us happy, but now we're kind of like, yeah, I have them. It was pretty sweet last year, but, oh, I can't wait for the things I get this year. You see, the things, they're temporary. They make us happy Christmas morning. Maybe they make us happy throughout that year, but eventually it's, it's just another thing, and we just want more. And Mabel's sitting there knowing, I can't have anything, but you know what I can have is I can have God. I can have a relationship with the Creator. She had cancer, and she realized that's not my biggest issue. You know, my biggest issue is sin. And Jesus took care of that for me on the cross. And now I can actually have that relationship with God, and that's what brought her joy. And that's why she could rejoice and worship God out of his goodness. The, the chapter is going to continue and say, they sat there and they just worshiped in the hospital bed. Because we worship God when we realize what he's done for us. Let me challenge you, next time we do worship and you just sit there, like, know that like, we, we should be people standing up and singing because of what God's done for us. Life with God is better. Don't let people tell you it's not. This is something that Naomi's starting to realize because she went away and things did not get better in her life. We're going to continue the story. I think we're in verse 14. It says, at this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. 
and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined, you might want to circle that word, to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. What's awesome that we're going to unpack here is this third lesson, is that obedience can make an impact on others. Obedience can make an impact on other people. You realize, Ruth, where did she grow up at? What was the place? Moab, okay? Because she grew up there, she did not grow up worshiping the Lord of the Bible. She's not a follower of the only one true God. But now, because Naomi says, you know what? I'm making moves in the right direction. I'm headed back to Bethlehem. I'm going to where God wants me to go. It's actually having a positive effect on Ruth. The Bible's going to say, what was that word I had you circle? She is now determined to go. What if people in your life were determined to follow God? What if people in your life were determined to start following the way you're living because you're following God? That would be crazy. That would be amazing. You realize your obedience to God, whenever you follow Scripture, is not because God says, oh, I want you to follow me, just do whatever I say. No, it's not because of that. We do it out of love, and you doing that can actually affect others in a positive way. I've had people in my life that have tried to tempt me and pressure me to do sinful things, but I had the courage to stand up and say, no, I'm not going to do that even though I was afraid. I thought they were going to mock me and tease me, and some people have. But there's been other people that have told me, hey, Taylor, because you stood up for what you believed, it actually, you know, you kind of inspired me. I actually kind of want to read the Bible a little bit. When we have courage, when we stand up, when we're bold, when we say, God, I'm going to follow you, know that it can actually have an effect on other people. And it does here for Ruth. The story continues. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Now, this word Naomi, uh, it, it means pleasant. And names back then meant way more than they do today. Her name meant pleasant. But do you think Naomi's having a pretty pleasant life right now? No, she's not. And she's going to go on to say that. She says, don't call me Naomi. She basically say, don't, don't call me pleasant. She told them, call me Mara, which means bitter, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full. You might want to underline that. I went away full. Even though she was starving for food, she was filled with God. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving at Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Ruth chapter 1 was a pretty depressing chapter. There wasn't much good that took place in Ruth chapter 1. But the good thing is that there's a chapter 2 coming. And in chapter 2, we're going to pick it up next week. We're actually going to see blessings in Naomi's life and in Ruth's life. They're going to be blessed financially. They're going to be blessed with security. They're going to be blessed with family. They're going to be blessed with food. And it all starts because of these two things. Blessings flow from repentance and honesty the last fill in the blank before the, the challenge at the end. Blessings flow from repentance and honesty. Repentance is a big word that we talk about a lot. Repentance is basically, it's turning around. And that's what Naomi did, right? She, she made moves in the other direction. She was heading this way. She was listening this way. But then she turned around. She's making moves in the right way. That's what repentance is. It's when we turn around and we start following God. Blessings are going to start coming because of that. And then do you realize how honest she was at the end of this chapter? They're like, Naomi! She says, don't call me that. It's like, uh, that's your name. Yeah, well, my name means pleasant. I'm not pleasant right now. Don't call me that. Call me Mara. Mara, what the heck is that? It means bitter. I'm very bitter. Call me bitter. Like, she's being so honest right now. She's going to say, I, I messed up. I, I went away full. I came back empty. Some of us in this room, we need to be honest where we're at. We need to be honest say, hey, I haven't been following God. 
I haven't been doing the things he's been asking me to do. I'm going to admit that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight for surrender. I'm going to say, God, I'm now going to follow you. And that's where the blessings are going to come. And that's what we're going to see as we dive into scripture, uh, dive into chapter 2 and 3 and 4 the following weeks. One last story I want to share with you before I give you the last point. Um, there is this pastor who was friends with a pilot. And this pilot had always wanted to take this pastor up in a plane. And finally he convinced the pastor, yeah, we can go up in this plane. And it's just a little two-seater plane, super small. Don't know if you guys have been in a plane like that before where the pilot's in the front and the passenger's just in the back, super small. They go up in this plane. They're having a good time. And then the pastor sees right in front of them that there's, there's like a thunderstorm going on. He sees dark clouds. He's seeing rain. And he's starting to freak out right now. Because he's like, we're in this two-seater plane, and that's what we're about to fly through? So he starts to tell the pilot, hey, we're going around that, right? We're going to go under it. We're going to go to the side of it. And as he's just talking the pilot's ear off, he realizes, like, there's no way we can go around this right now. We're going fast. We have to go right through this. And he's freaking out. He was brainstorming, all right, are there parachutes in here? Are we going to jump out? Like, what's going on? And the pilot shuts him up, and he says, you need to trust the vessel that's going to get us through the storm. You know, some of you guys have storms going on in your life. Things that you do not want to be going on right now. And some of you are going to be tempted to want to do things your own way. You're going to want to abandon the vessel being God. And you're going to want to say, maybe I'll jump out of the plane. If he did that, he would have been electrocuted. (laughs) We, We want to do things our own way. But we need to be people that trust the vessel. We need to trust God. We need to seek his presence. Because let me assure you, we're going to get through it. We're going to get through the storm. Doesn't mean it won't be bumpy. Doesn't mean it won't be scary. But God works things together for good. And we will get through. And that's what the pastor and the pilot did. They were able to get through. The pastor said, all right, I'll trust this. I'll trust what's going on. My hope this Christmas season guys, is that we can crave God's presence more than we crave presence under the Christmas tree. Those things are going to make us happy temporarily. God's presence is going to give us joy forever. We got to seek those things. And him is where we find love. It's where we find peace. It's where we find security. It's where we find hope. And those are the things that we really want. You want the new iPhone? You're going to want a new iPhone next Christmas. You want the new shoes? They're going to get dirty a month later. You're going to want new shoes. At least in God's presence, like he says, I'm promising you these things. And they're there eternally forever. So let's seek him. My question for you guys is what move do you need to make? What move do I need to make? Some of you are running from God. Turn back. Make moves in the right direction and pursue him. If you have any questions, ask me afterward. I'm going to pray and we're going to do our raffle. Garrett, there's some stuff. Look in the bag over there by the lost and found that Macy brought. We can raffle off some of that stuff. Let's go ahead and pray, guys. Jesus, just I want to thank you for your presence. God, I pray that we could be people that want to pursue you, that want to run into your arms. God, you love us so much. You're not some distant God, but you're close, and you want that relationship with us. God, some of us say we're in a relationship, but we haven't been living for you. I pray, Lord, that we could turn around and we can make moves right back towards you. God, we love you. Help us to trust you more. It's in your name we pray. Amen.